Hello, everyone. Welcome back, and thank you for joining us yet again. My name is Ricardo McCray, and this is another episode of Framing, Exploring Ideas in Context. And today, we're going to explore social media influencers, what the hell that means, and how much money they're <laughs> worth or not. So joining me in the hot seat, I have uh, someone I'm actually very proud to call a dear friend and an awesome human being. Uh, she is known on Aww. Twitter, Jacqueline Denise <laughs> Co. And I'll post that in a bit so people can follow her. Just click her profile and get it. She's the owner of Jacqueline Denise Communications, a lifestyle marketing PR firm that does one-on-one -on -one consulting. And they tend to focus on niche areas. What, what sort of areas do you focus on in, in, your, in your business? Uh, I work with boutique brands, and I would say independents more so. Um, and I put them in the category of lifestyle communications, but really they're, they fall under anything from fashion to yoga, um, but very much more. And, and I certainly lean towards having a much more female-oriented audience, which I'm sure right. if anyone's checked out any of my branding, they can <laughs> tell it's a little on the feminine side. <laughs> It's lovely. I love it. It's awesome branding on, you. on your site. And I really like what you've done with it. I've seen it over the years and it's really, really, really well Thank done. Thank you. Great laydowns and photography. It's just, it's really slick, really slick. Everyone should check it out. Awesome. Now let's jump into this topic, uh, social media influencers. Uh, yeah. They've been all the rage. Everybody is an influencer and how many followers you have. And, you know, you come from the world of traditional marketing. Uh, you know, tell me a bit about how that worked and then we'll contrast it to these influencers. So it's really interesting because it's certainly, I mean, like anything to do with the marketing industry and well, any industry, it's constantly evolving. And I would say one thing that is really important to be aware of in this industry is how fast it's evolving, mm -hmm. um, which we really know to be true with anything to do with social media. And I think the trick with it when it starts to become part of your business is how quickly one can keep up because PR traditionally was anyone who's either from the world of traditional public relations, it is, again, traditionally known as to be media relations, pitching to editors, which it very much still is. But the term PR has changed so much over the years, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that social media is such a big part of our everyday lives. Right. whether we want it to be or not. Um, and where influencers come into that is when, I guess you could say the term influencer first began and people first started blogging, so many of these blogs as know started from it really being a hobby. Like This didn't start as a career. It grew into a career for many people. Right. Yeah, and, it was just sort yeah. of this zone of uh, people doing blogs. They're writing. They're enjoying it. I love you know, making cookies that in the shape of a gingerbread man, and I'm doing that, and I put them online, and it starts to get popular. Next thing you know, there are thousands of people following my blog about gingerbread men. Exactly. Like. And all of a sudden, I have this audience, and, uh, you know, it's Gary Vaynerchuk that says, everybody on social media is a broadcasting company and has a platform who should start <laughs> acting like it. So it's yeah. word of mouth, obviously, the number one way to spread any kind of news about anything. It's always been the best and still is. Uh, Gary says that word of mouth is social media. I'm sorry, social media influencers are using social media's word of mouth at scale, where 100%. I, Ricardo, staying here in Toronto can actually scale up and have tens of thousands of people or millions following me, depending on what I'm talking about. So exactly. it's, to, you know, to underscore your point, it's this is where the the power of it comes in. So how long ago did that start? Would you say, was that five years, three years where this thing really started taking off? Do you know? I would say more than three years, but it's really hard to, to pinpoint it because for some, it's really new as of this year, again, because it's growing, but it's definitely been around for years. And it all started with people, again, starting these things, um, starting blogs, um, when Twitter came to be a thing, um, and then Instagram story in the last couple of years, it was, it started out for influencers or bloggers as a bit of a hobby. And then when people realized these audiences can grow, we can all be 
um, media, essentially, then right. there was suddenly an opportunity to clap, capitalize on that and create an income out of it. So as influencers began to create an income by partnering with brands, um, and the partnerships with brands all started with brands reaching out to them in many cases. I'm sure many connected with brands to say, mm -hmm. hey, this is what I can do for, me, for you. This is the following that I have. How can we work together? Um, but then it was a combination of that and brands reaching out to them saying, we'd love to get our name out there. How can you help? So right. when people started realizing they suddenly um, had, they were suddenly this tool and this voice um, to build other brands, why not create a business out of it, <laughs> right? Now, to that point, let's get right into the money. How much, how much is it worth? How much is a tweet worth? How much is uh, an Instagram post worth? Is it, is it just about eyeballs? How many people you have on, on your list or is it more about engagement? I know, uh, what's his name, Kevin Hart, got mm. paid $2 million to send two tweets. I'm like, that's, that's wild. Business. That's a good business. I mean, that's on the upper end of the 1% of people. <laughs> He's in the 1% of the influencer world. I think it's um, less you... than that. <laughs> <laughs> and, but but the him. average person's not getting $2 million to send a tweet. So no. what can someone expect? Let's say I'm on Instagram. I have a blog about, you know, branding and business. And I have 10,000 followers on Instagram. Oh, what's that worth? Like, where do I go to cash that in? Make some yeah. money. Again, it's a tough thing to put a number on because there is such a wide range of numbers for these things. Um, and I don't want to look at it strictly based on the number of followers. I think engagement is a really important thing to look at. Just like if you were putting together, if you saw anyone's media kit um, when it comes to numbers and how engaged they are, what kind of coverage they get. Yes, um, and you can go right back to traditional PR and start measuring impressions. But that's no different than saying, I have 10,000 followers, therefore there must have been 10,000 people looking at it, when there may have been three, right? So it's, it's tricky to do it from solely a number standpoint. I think you do have to look at engagement. I think you do have to look at what the industry is in um, and what how they're willing to talk about the product. Is it just a mention? Um, right. So... From my is it perspective, a product placement is it a write up? Is it right? exactly like you have to put, um, and that's where then it adds a whole other layer of complication and why the pricing structure can be so different depending on uh, from influencer to influencer because you're essentially customizing every single approach, right? So <laughs> yes. that's why it becomes a full time it could potentially become a full-time job if there's a lot to manage with it. And it wasn't, yes. uh, from a PR perspective, it's not as simple as traditionally pitching to an editor now or a producer. And if the timing's right and the, the product or service is right, then they'll talk about it. Now it's, yes, that is a huge part of PR, but also managing relationships with influencers is a large part as well. And that's not just many now have their own um media kits put together where they'll say an Instagram, this is what I charge for an Instagram. Wow. And, and it's all original content of theirs. Some will do programs with you where it's, they'll essentially share a campaign, but most because the whole point of social media is to be authentic and genuine, they still want to cover their own content. So right. they'll say for an Instagram, this is what I charge an Instagram plus a blog post. It, it changes. So let, let me understand this. And I also want to say welcome to Satish. Thanks for joining. I see you up here, Desi Fest. Uh, if you or Cher Jones want to jump in and join the conversation, click the button. The water's warm. We love it. <laughs> <laughs> love to have you on. Uh, so right back to what we we're saying. So people yeah. have these, these price points. Um, yeah. It's really around, uh, this is my... I'm a blogger about, I don't know, lifestyle in Toronto. And for me to mention your product or this, let's say this mouse, yeah. I'm uh, 500 bucks for me to do one Instagram post. I'm just making up a number. No, uh, that's, that's totally a legit number. The lowest number I've seen as of late is 150 for a post. Um, $2,000. Is it just like me taking a picture of this and just saying, hey, this mouse is awesome, blah, 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 150 bucks. 
So it goes from 150 bucks on the from the lowest you've seen to a million dollars for a tweet. <laughs> So there's Basically. a bit of a gap between values. There's a huge gap, a huge gap. So who is determining um, this value? Is it just sort of like, yo, I feel this is what it's worth. You know, you talked about engagement, like how engaged is that audience? And is that driving true value uh, monetarily for people when it comes to? It is. And I think it also, I mean, not I think, I know based on the conversations that I've had, it also changes again, based on where you're from. I've worked with a number of influencers in different parts of the U.S. who have a significantly larger following than many Canadian um, influencers. Satish Satish just joined us. And, (laughs) hey, and their price points are are lower and they're more willing to still do some of the... um, trades in combination with right. so again that that's that's another conversation in and of itself of how doing um sharing in exchange for a product is upsetting those who are trying to build a business out of it and right. in all fairness you almost need to because an influencer has now become a career for many people you have to look at that conversation as or at least i certainly try to as I want to get paid for the service that I offer as much as it would be great because I believe in the clients I work with to get some right. of the product, their product doesn't pay the rent, right? Right, So right. because right. it's becoming a business, you kind of have to look at it in, in a similar light. Right. So Satish, what do you think about this? You jumped in here, man. Yeah, How you know, been, man? How's that? that Satish is an <laughs> awesome human being. Hi, guys. Um, is just... Just finished Desi Fest here in Toronto with 10,000 people down at Denda Square, one of the largest South Asian gatherings and festivals in Ontario. So Paul Hars on stage, I'm extra tanned. <laughs> it's not <laughs> I, I didn't realize I was logged in as, as uh, Daisy Fest on Twitter when I connected. Great platform, by the way. First time me being on it. So yeah, it's, I, it's, I, I love it, man. We're connecting about think? dads. We gotta be doing a dad blab. You're gonna have to show me how to sleep train. Yeah. <laughs> A very I important conversation. I think it's the opposite now. They get me so tired that they put me to sleep, <laughs> and then they watch Netflix. So <laughs> it's been uh, it's been great. But I just wanted to jump in on this real quick because uh, being on the brand side, we've done a lot of yeah. social influencer sort of outreach program. And I come from old school days when they were just bloggers right. creating content, and now they're influencers. And so for me, it's it's really been an interesting shift as it became a career for a bunch of people um yeah. but i had the same challenge where some of my clients were you know how do you put a price on 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 the cost of per unit i mean on top of that how do we even validate for example who their customer base is you know yeah. in in facebook you can't to some level but you take a platform like instagram there's there's no way to really using a third party tool fully understand who are your followers and what's their value look like um so there's a there's a shop down the street called uh, Hashtag Paid that I met. Some of you might have heard them. But they've got this really cool online service where you can plug in your account and, and their math sort of spits out a number for you. Um, oh, really? Yeah, so I tried both Instagram accounts, my personal one, and I tried the Daisy Fest one. What's and, it worth, man? What's it worth? Yeah, so apparently <laughs> a post on Daisy Fest uh, is anywhere between 60 and and $100. Nice, respect. And then uh, individually, I'm I'm below forty dollars. Oh, which uh, which is interesting. So, and and you know that's something that's sort of on a, on a pay as you go model that they have. So at any point, you know, I can log in, uh, put in my my price point, and or show based on what influence that they already have, uh, what content they have, and I can just using the system with credit card, contact the influencer, tell them what kind of content I want, how many I want, what frequency I want. And, and you just pay for it and, you know, you own 100% of that content, right? So part of it was awesome to see innovation. The right. other part was scary because a third of my business is content creation for social and clients, which as of two weeks ago, I'm like, I would never need to do that again. <laughs> I just call these influencers. <laughs> Swipe the card and be like, I need how many you want? Just pull yeah, the card. <laughs> you know, so, so it's been really interesting to see how, Content is, is important, and uh, we went from these custom sort of content creation process to, you know, if Ricardo's got great content, all your fans like it, I'm just going to pay you to do more of it. Right. 
I think that's right. a great model, and I do have awesome content, and I am accepting checks. <laughs> yes, I will pay you forty nine dollars <laughs> per post. But per yeah. post. I'm like, I do about six hundred a day. <laughs> so just I like take credit cards. Yeah, and you know, we we tried that for Daisy Fest a little bit, where you know we don't have a lot of money for uh, traditional media, and so yeah. literally I was paying some influencers to create content, and then taking the leftover to boost that content, and we had incredible you know, uh, reach and, and, and at a global level, it's at, at a minuscule budget than what I used to spend. And the reach was like exponential. Wow. So you, you'd use, you're spending 10% of the budget on influencers yeah. for this and then getting exponential returns on the Yes. Yeah, cause, cause even the process of creating content took so much time, right? right? Uh, and, and right. you have to shoot it, you have to post produce yeah. it. Now there's already somebody doing it daily, no matter what, whether I pay them or not. They're right. shooting those beautiful cereal shots and the right. shopping shots. I just have to say the next one you do, I'll pay you for it. And add your brand or talk about your festival in that in some exactly. way. And exactly. just redirect that, that attention. So attention is really, and I see that Wagner just jumped in here. Come on, man, jump in the seat. Uh, <laughs> welcome. <laughs> and uh, so people are all this. So are, are really influencers replacing big agencies and are they replacing uh, traditional media? I mean, yeah, no PR is traditional PR. No harder because of influencers in the mix. Jack. I would say it definitely adds a lot of challenges. I think it does depend on the types of clients that you're working with. Um, and, and it really in that, at that point it comes down to budget because I work with a lot of boutique brands. I see budget from a very different perspective mm-hmm. um, than those brands who have um, budgets to put 250,000 down on a social campaign. Right. Um, for me, that 250,000 would be years worth of social. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right? so, for some of my clients. Not that I don't want them to grow. I would love that. But it's just a different, it's being in a different place in business. So um, it's definitely a balance of, from a PR perspective, absolutely respecting the fact that these influencers have created a career. So if a client doesn't have a budget for it, then it's understanding that and saying, okay, great, perhaps it's not going to work this time. Or this is the budget, let me know what we can do. Because you still, at the end of the day, it's still a relationship management. Right. So I, I just, I think I accidentally deleted a comment that uh, Gilbert uh, just posted. Could you put that in again? He was quoting some stats. He's writing a book right now on social media influencers. And he's saying, uh, studies show that for every dollar spent on social, you get $9 ROI on it. With social media influencers specifically. Hmm. So, I mean, that, that just underscores what uh, Satish just said is like, I'm spending 10% of the budget and getting, you know, 10 times the lift in opposed to buying TV and radio and having to do all that, that heavy lifting. So, well, it is very much regardless. Yes, it's paid, but it's still very much uh, a referral, essentially a referral program. Mm -hmm. So people are still purchasing based on, if the person that they're following is talking about something that they believe in, because really influencers are no longer even bothering to do something. If it's not a brand that they don't believe in or wouldn't try themselves, which I think is outstanding because you need to put some integrity in this. It's not just pay me some money and Oh, look at this. I have Hennessy. And I'm like, I have a baby. (laughs) Hennessy is not a good match right now. (laughs) A couple years ago in the single life that might've worked, but it's off brand. And it's, I, I really think that's a, that's a good uh, trend that it should be fostered. It's like, I actually listen to people that I follow. And if, you know, you recommend something to me, Jacqueline, or, you know, anyone on this platform, Wagner to Satish, it's, I take that seriously. You see, you know what, this is a good microphone. I'll be like, I am highly likely if I'm looking for a mic to just buy it. Just because okay. you've tried it, you said. So in that sense, uh, I would hate to think that, you're being paid to have that mic sit there <laughs> and occasionally mention the Yeti 61950, whatever the mic is. Uh, that would have me turn off completely off anything you say. It would completely ruin credibility with me. So it's a, it's a weird fine line. Like I, I work with a lot of artists and musicians 
and and we 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 are friends first on social, which is why I follow them. Uh, but then everybody becomes a billboard, <laughs> right? Yeah. And and it's a little annoying because you want to support them because they do make some money. But I am following you on social to see what's going on with you and your life and your music. And if every second or third post is a product shot, a venue shot, a shout out to something, you, you start to question uh, where do we have authentic relationships if every platform ends up being a, a way to push commerce. Yeah, the marketers come sure. in, as, as, as they say, and, uh, and, and ruin everything. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever is awesome at some point, <laughs> they come in and just like, let's put our ads on this and everyone can look like a NASCAR driver. <laughs> it's just like, whoa. Wagner, thanks for joining us, man. Thanks for jumping in. What do you have of to course. say about this? Hey, I never saw your email, by the way. Did you forget to send it? No, I sent it through your website. It may have had some really? technical oh, glitch. contact yeah. form? Yeah. Huh. All right, I'm going to have to check on that next. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, hey, guys. Uh, Jacqueline and... Uh, Satish. Of, Satish? Satish. Of Desi, Satish, yeah. Satish? Hey. Good to, to meet you. I don't think I've met you guys before. Um, nice to meet you. Well, Ricardo knows my background just for you guys before I say anything so you know who I am. I, um, I actually work for uh, an agency here in Orlando, Florida. Uh, I head up strategy and insights and used to own an agency for about nine years, uh, for nine years, not nine years prior, but a couple of years ago, uh, I had an agency for about nine years and sold it and then uh, decided I'd let someone else worry about payroll and just do what I enjoy doing. <laughs> <laughs> so seemed like a, you know, a win -win. yeah, sort of, you know, there are days, you <laughs> know what I mean? There are days when I miss being my own boss, but anyway, um, so so before, um, before you jump into yeah. this, I want to ask what type could you name a couple clients? I know I have your bio here and we got a little off track, but you've, I mean, that we currently work on or that, that I've worked on in general? That you've worked on. I mean, you, you're being modest, but everything from Coca Cola, <laughs> Google, Dell, mm -hmm. uh, Target, Ford. So, so Wagner's has a depth of experience and, uh, and my thing? my niche has been uh, over the years. I've done a lot of work with uh, experiential marketing and social, what I call social activation marketing, right. which is uh, more than even social media marketing. It's about uh, activating uh, individuals through a variety of social platforms, whether they be online or offline, uh, and the integration of the two. And so, um, so yeah, so I, I worked with a lot of major brands in in those kind of uh capabilities and um uh currently have been uh working for the last few years with uh sea world and um uh few 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 other brands a whole mix of food and beverage and so forth but um but it's it's you know the topic i think is really interesting because and i i forgive me that i i missed the beginning of it so if i if i say something that you're like we well, you already covered just let me know but um <laughs> But I I heard the tail end about the the pay you know paying the influencers and um, I have I have an issue with it a, a lot of people are doing it and and I I'll tell you what what my my issue is first and foremost Ricardo you made a great point about you know marketers and agencies and all these people ruining everything ruining right? everything what, what the, <laughs> the devil. So, so this is how this is how brands and advertisers and agencies ruined everything in the beginning, right? Yeah. In the very beginning, when we talk sixties and seventies, um, they were jingles, right? And the the space wasn't as fragmented, and uh, different brands were trying to make the most clever jingles that would brainwash you into never forgetting their brand and hopefully buying their product even if you never thought you needed that product and you probably right. still didn't need that product, but they were going to convince you that you needed to buy that product. Right. So that was fifties and sixties kind of advertising and marketing. And as we moved into the decades, people started to get irritated with that. They started seeing brands that were misleading them, that were tricking them into and persuading them to purchase things that they never needed. 
And so they become wiser. New generations came in. They, they taught their kids, hey, you know, you got to read the labels. You, you have to do research. And, oh, there's this the great thing about, yeah, yeah there's, there's the internet, consumer reviews. So uh, people became much more educated. And then they were in the driver's seat saying, okay, you can't trick me anymore. Now I want to know, do you fit all these this criteria? Right. Um, so then what ended up happening is that advertising marketing shifted to where let's make the most amount of noise. So let's, let's, uh, you know, it, it, with TV, print, for example, TV, radio, yeah, like, lots of frequency. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to buy millions of dollars worth of spots that you're barely even going to listen to your program <laughs> or see your program. All you're going to see is my spots <laughs> until you buy the damn product. And, right. and so a lot of that kind of stuff happened. So fast forwarding a little bit to today, um, I fear that that people are trying to um, utilize influencers in the same way that we made the mistakes in previous decades, um, which was, you know, trying to create a, a paid army of people that will persuade their peers to purchase a brand or a product um, that, that perhaps they do need, but right. maybe being a little disingenuous. And, and I, I believe, and I'm curious what you guys think, uh, I, I believe that what's great about influencer marketing and what's great about social marketing is the sincerity of it, the relevance and the organic nature of it. And, and us advertisers and agencies want to rush the process. We don't want to wait. We don't want to invest in creating the relationship because that takes time. We want we want results now. Our clients, they want results now. Our and in doing so, tomorrow in numbers, like, let me know what sort of traction they're getting. Out. Yeah. And, and because of that, then we're trying to skip through the process and saying, okay, well, I'm going to pay influencers now. So I'm going to, I'm going to make it happen faster. You're going to buy you know? it. You're going to buy this. Yeah. And I think it's a mistake. I, I, maybe there are some, some situations where there are influencers that are getting paid and they also really believe in the brand or the product. Right. But I, I would say that a lot of them are just believing in the money. A lot of, I see guys on, and I'll stop talking because I'm blabbing a lot, but <laughs> you know, I see a lot. Of, <laughs> I see a lot of guys on uh, here um, who are also celebrities, if you will, on Periscope and other platforms that they talk about how they're content creators and they're, right. they're influencers. And, and I want to peel back that onion and say, well, that's not who you are. I mean, that's maybe what you do, but who are you really? You know, you, you didn't you didn't wake up one day and said and say, I'm going to be an influencer and content generator. Nobody cares. <laughs> you know, I mean, who Nobody are you? Great one is saying that. Nobody's putting that down on a sheet of paper. No, but there's some guys, and I won't name their names, but you know the people out there. Some yeah. of them are very proud about them about themselves being great influencers and content generators that are now getting brands that are calling them because of their influence and their influence in a certain segment uh, that they want to pay them or position them to promote a product. And so I think there's, I think it's getting kind of disingenuous. I don't know. What, what do you guys think? Well, to, to jump in for a quick second, uh, w one of the things that's really interesting is um, I still run an agency. Nobody's purchased me yet. So unfortunately I have to get up and come to work. Uh, the but, joys of being your own boss. This is, this is how we, we brand this. One. The joys of being your own boss. Doing everything yeah, you want. Uh, <laughs> we, we, we used to get briefs where it was really about um, finding the right person as an ambassador, right? Like, you know, if we did a, if we did a, a chef program, it'll be, let's find this thought of a chef who has got this personality, et cetera. And, and you know, once we moved into this influencer, um, we don't actually even, in to my opinion, care about the actual influencer. It's the people that are following them. So to your point, mm -hmm. yes, a lot of them are, are so-called content generators and content creators, but really, I don't really care about you, but I care about whatever these people following you are going to do for your posts. Right. So is yes. really, here's this thing yeah. really interesting. Yeah. Here's something I heard yesterday right. that was really uh, interesting. It said people come, like for, when it came to podcasting, they come for the topic, but they stay for the host. So mm -hmm. are we mm -hmm. following influencers because of, you know, I like cameras, so I'm going to follow the great photographers. And then if like, if the photographer is actually just being a jerk and promoting stuff, 
all the time. Uh, do I unfollow that person? Do I, I'm like, okay, you're just, you're just here trying to make your own money. I'm out. Like, so it's, it's this tight line that people sort of have to walk between you want to get paid, but you don't want to be that Shen Wow guy who's actually just, <laughs> you know, it's like it's <laughs> obvious to everyone. It's like, really? It's slices and right. it slices. It's how do we integrate? How do we get, uh, sort of organic, natural brands connected with people that actually really use and love them. You know what, Ricardo, I think that, I think it's, it's a little like, uh, a little like native advertising. I think that, uh, uh, I think influencers to be successful in influencing their audience for, uh, the benefit of the brands or the advertisers. I think that um, they really, in their content or in their delivery, they need to be just naturally talking and, and engaging with entertaining value, which is really what people are out mm-hmm. there for. Uh, mm-hmm. That's why inbound marketing works so well, because people aren't uh, looking to be sold to. They want education. And through education, they may then take an interest in buying something. But it's education first. It's entertainment first. So those influencers um, entertain and then weave into their story you know, uh, this cool product or let, let's say a webcam, for example, you know, now right. um, yeah, using this webcam, it's really cool. What do you guys think? Not, not in, instead saying, hey, this webcam is really good and I don't care what you guys think and I'm going to tell you about all the features and making it <laughs> seem like a, a really question. It. Yeah. <laughs> but it may, you know, creating a conversation and weaving it in, I think it needs to be very natural like that for it to work. And, and then for, uh, for their audience to, uh, be a loyal audience because I think they would start to lose an audience um, certainly from from maybe not the entertainment side but as far as you know the pushing of products you know? so who's more important the agency or the eyeballs Ooh. anyone anyone I, <laughs> I'm about to no, say I something. Have silence I'm like what could <laughs> Everyone I have an like, answer but I, I didn't want to interrupt yeah. Jacqueline so Come on, Jack. No, I think okay. I think it has to be that it needs to go back essentially to sort of the brief concept that you mentioned. And we as agencies and um, PR reps need to spend more time strategizing who we want to connect with so that it does in turn feel genuine. Because if we're going to blanket influencers, not only is it not very interesting to them Life because the they're essentially be media, <laughs> it's also... <laughs> Amazon. <laughs> We're also getting the ones that aren't as genuine. They're the pay, one paid post, the two paid posts, whatever the contract might be, but they're not going to continue finding authentic ways to incorporate into their life. So I think it's there's like, both are equally important because we need to do just as good a job treating them as one of our clients' target audiences, as the audience that we want to reach. Right. So it's, it's sort of raising the level of uh, integrity in the industry across the board from the agency side, as well as the influencer, you know, consumer eyeball side of things where it's, we want to follow authentic people and they want to actually have authentic people represent their brands so sort of. Absolutely. Because yeah. whatever you might want to call them, be it influencers, brand ambassadors, I've heard them call themselves brand right. architects whatever yeah. that might nice, be nice yeah. that's a good one uh-huh. that's worth a lot of money right there i like that that's good that's, those are the expensive ones <laughs> my minimum um, post is a thousand dollars i'm a brand architect that's different brand architect i like that but brand doctor. whatever you <laughs> want to call yourself i totally lack of what's going to say. um whatever you want to to identify yourself as at the end of the day it all goes back to relationships. So the integrity then also lies in, I think the agency is doing just as good a job focusing on what relationships we want to build with these ambassadors, influencers, whatnot. Um, yeah. Yeah. Here's, here's a struggle for I me all with that, that. I wanted to hear it, sorry. <laughs> um, is, you know, uh, from the agency <clears throat> side, a, a lot of the value we add is when we have those relationships, right? So we can, speak to the ambassadors or find the influencers. And uh, lately I feel like this, this sense of a rush because if, if I can't move fast enough to get an influencer, they can go directly. Right. So it's yeah, kind of totally. like before there was this, there was this magic sauce of, Hey, 
go get us some people. We don't know how, right. but you guys go do it. Then we'll go and do some focus groups and find some people and network and, and validate them and have the breathing room to say, here's a few people we think can really represent your brand. Now it's like, I need some influencer for a campaign Monday morning. It's Wednesday. Go. Yeah. And then... Yeah. And, and what are you using or what do you think people should be using to, to validate these influencers? Like, is it, uh, we talked about this briefly in the beginning, Jax, is it just the, the number? Like if you've got the big number, you win or is it engagement? Is it, I might have 200 people on my Twitter, but damn, there's a lot of retweets. So it's like, it's 200 focused people about something uh, or I could have 20,000 people on there and maybe, you know, 0.1% of them retweet or even like or share something. So I think it has to do with engagement. That's, that's my stand on that. It's, yeah. I see people like, engaging on stuff. I'm checking people out on clout and I'm seeing your clout score because that's measuring your engagement or the likelihood for somebody else to reshare or engage with whatever it is that you're sharing. So are you just making a lot of noise <laughs> or yeah, yeah, talking yeah. to yourself or are you actually creating the, you know, the content creator, the yeah. brand architect, is it? Yeah. It's actually well, something out there that my audience wants. Well, and customer I, acquisition is now a mathematical formula, right? Yeah. So uh, the, yeah. the strategic thinking and the science that we, we used to try to employ to get people to like our fan pages or follow us, like, you know, we, we needed to build AC Fest fan page up to just over 4,000 for sponsorship to make sense. So <laughs> we just called Facebook and gave them a check and, we started getting fans, <laughs> you know, uh, and, 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 and so while they're not engaged yet and it will take time, we, right. we, we know now there's a formula with a dollar value to get fans. So mm -hmm. to your point, really, it, it has to come down to what is the engagement and then whatever this engagement is, what's the value of that? Like, so what? hundred people retweeted something. How does it drive back to the brand's objective to sell something or right. do something else? Right well, I, th I think it was uh, Gil, um, I keep mispronouncing his Gilbert? name. Gilbert? Yeah, I, yeah, I, I actually like... glasses on, man. This is going to be next actually, level for me. I actually like what he said. If you don't mind, I was going to I was gonna give him a quick answer that, um, you know, he said he knows someone with 350,000 followers with less engagement that he gets with his 7,000 or so. And I was going to say that, you know, um, I, I generally do not care about number of followers or uh, let's say an email program. I don't care um, how big your email list is. What I care about with your email is, you know, what is your click through rate? You know, what is your, what is your open rate? Um, that's what I care about. Uh, as far as followers, man, I can, I can buy someone can. millions of followers, but you yeah. know what? If, if nobody is engaging, who cares? It's just numbers. <laughs> What's important is that if you have 7,000 followers and you have a higher percentage of, um, engagement to follower ratio than those 350,000, then you're doing a lot better with that 300 than that 350,000 one, yeah. you know? It's, I always look at this, how many tweets someone's doing on Twitter. Like, I'm about 185,000 tweets, and I have 100 people following me. I, I always envision that person sitting in the corner, talking to themselves, <laughs> <laughs> like, all day long, going, why would anyone listen to me? What's going on? And, like, just, like, yeah. just turn around, like, talk yeah. to a human. Like, you are talking to yourself if you did 100,000 tweets, and you have, like, 1,000 followers. It's like, for every 1,000 things you do, one person responds to it. Like, look yeah. at that number. And, and, you know, I, I think that, I think that, yes, you know, that there, there is some science to all of this, but, but a lot of it is so psychological and sociological that you really need to tap into the emotion, the, the behavior of your audience and, and, and make sure that, that what you're saying and, and how you're speaking and connecting with them is relevant to, you know, and it's, and it's not overtly forced to, um, to, to receive an engagement or to receive an ROI. Uh, Cause you, certainly that's what you want, or that's what your clients want. Right. And I, I to, to your point, I, you know, man, I, I, I was, I was, you know, thinking about that client example where you're like, they're in a rush to get influencers and they're going to get it themselves if you don't get it. And I'm thinking, oh man, that's a nightmare, you know, to, <laughs> to, to have someone rushing me like that. I just want to tell them, listen, you know, make sure that your, your message is strong. Your product and service is, is, is great. 
um, and that we're targeting the right audience and it's going to happen, but you force it and you rush it and it's not going to be successful. Let, nice. let it, let it run its course, you know, correctly. You know, I don't see this thing is like, uh, like dating. It's, you know, don't go out on a date and expect to uh, get married on the first date. Like, let's just meet, let's say hello. We might go on a second date, buy a little dinner, you know, like hold hands. Yeah. Like the basic, you can't rush this. Like you can't just like order a bride and like have it delivered and let, let's go and life is going. Like those things don't work. And it's, once you apply that principle to branding or, well, like, that's a different blab. That's a different blab. I saw <laughs> But I think it, it's changed so much, though. I think this is a new world, and that's the that's the problem, right? To 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 Wagner's point, it's 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 fast moving because they can do it, right? Yeah. Back then, when you're spending you know hundreds of thousand dollars on a program, you have to go slow because you can't redo it. But today, you take a ten thousand yeah. dollar project. Throw it out to a bunch of influencers. What's the worst case? Nobody cares. Right. Then you do it again with another ten thousand dollars, right? So you can move pretty fast. And to tie in awkwardly into your dating analogy, it's like <laughs> back then you need to you need to go out physically to meet other people. Right. You can just swipe now on Tinder. Yeah, you're on, you're six Tinder. hours a day. <laughs> so you don't right. care about quality anymore because you don't have the time. You're just investing in quantity because. The cost of failure is not that high. It's, it's yeah, it's, right. like, it's right. like ten cents to fail now. So it's like, let's just yeah. Kill and, and, and then, then you have the example of like, which everybody's tired of hearing, the Chewbacca mom, right? Yeah. Um, everybody's over talked that that subject. And Fifteen it's become, minutes of fame is over. <laughs> uh, but it, 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 but they're still talking in our ad world, and it's it's like a case study for creating a viral video, you know, and it, but, but I'll, I'll tell you in smaller, in smaller scales, I mean, that was a fluke. Sometimes they, and a lot of times those yeah. things, people look at it, they want to study it, but you got to say it's a fluke. It's not always going to happen, but in smaller scales, I mean, those kind of things do happen. And I think there's, um, I don't know, I, I'm a, I'm not anti, you know, paying for the influence, but I'm I'm so much more pro um, creating it organically and encouraging it and and giving people the tools so that they can evangelize uh, the brand or the product um, as opposed to um, tapping into their core influencers and paying them a large sum of money uh, to attempt to do that. But you know I I understand that you know I'm not trying to dismiss the business model and. In, in doing that too. But I, I think that um, if it can be something that's uh, integrated well with a, with a strong organic program, I think organically is where you want to ultimately go, you know? I like to think of, of uh, what's that, what's that, what's that? Viral is more of a bonus and an outcome <laughs> than an actual uh, plan. You can't plan for viral. Viral is something that just, you know, it's like trying to plan for love. Like you could technically plan, but until it's you the actually... viral button, all you have to do is <laughs> press this button and it goes viral. <laughs> I have an app, but it's a million dollars for me to push that button. You know, <laughs> and it's it's uh, when I hear people wanting viral, like, hey, I need a viral campaign. I'm like, okay, just our expectations will never be on the same page. <laughs> and not and not me. Like that's gonna be insane. There's yeah. just no way that that's gonna happen. You know what's the opposite? Sometimes I say, yes, I will give you viral. Now what? And then they don't know what to do. <laughs> it's a good one. Yeah. yeah like, we want this viral campaign. I'm like, cool. Okay, let's get started. Yeah. Slide like, the check really? across the table. It's, it's, it's going to go slide viral? at a number. I don't know if you want to. Why wouldn't it go viral? Let's get started. Well, you know, let's go. <laughs> what you do. never called back either. <laughs> what you do is you deliver this so-called viral campaign. Yeah. And then they say, all right, what what now? I got the viral campaign. It didn't go viral. Oh, no, no, no. You said you wanted a viral campaign. You didn't say you wanted to go viral. So here's your viral campaign. Have a good day. <laughs> now, I'm you know sitting on the agency side working with I mean, a lot of the work I do is B2C. So this topic of social influencers and more, like it's been such a hot topic for the last two to three years. And, and I feel like it, it has to 
it hasn't settled down yet to find some strategic ways to implement it, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's the same way where once my clients can go directly to Facebook, I will never be the smart guy in the room because Facebook is a phone call away. And so I find, you know, even with the influencers back then, the, 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 the real influencer was a creative person. But we would deal with a team around them that were smart business folks. Mm -hmm. And you could have sort of brand conversations and what you can do and not. But they were just a creative soul. I'm the chef. I'm the painter. I'm the whatever. Uh, now you're putting that onus on an everyday person who just happens to have a great creative mind to understand the brand and the ROI and the da-da-da. I don't like, even know Whoa. if they understand that. They're just doing they what don't. they're doing. They love it. And people yeah. Like everyone is in this sort of Starbucks voyeuristic way of like they're sitting there with their coffee is going, all right, let's sit here on Instagram, see what people yeah. are doing. And if you create something visually appealing, people are going to watch it yeah. over and right. over again. So I, I don't know if there's any business logic behind that, but at a certain point you see those numbers, money is going to start to be coming in, into play in a little way. And it's, I don't know if those influencers are actually business people. Like they're, they're really... not. And so you, you kind of put, you know, people like us in the middle with the client is saying, influence this like every client make it bigger make it red make, make it my logo you know, one. yeah <laughs> you know and you're like okay cool and then i'm going to this everyday person who you're paying a couple hundred bucks for a post giving them the strategic thing and then go dude i just want to be real i'm being real right now in my contact i'm gonna sell out i'm like you sort of did already you took 100 like, bucks if yeah. you're gonna cost me a client you need to cut that out <laughs> yeah. it's like when when the hip-hop gangsters were saying they were keeping it real but they were pocketing like gazillions of dollars it's exactly. like i'm still from the hood i'm still from the hood <laughs> you ain't from the hood <laughs> you, drive a you have a driver buddy and a maid, like. the hood of my ferrari <laughs> um well, here I'll, I'll 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 drop a name real quick, Brian Fanzo, right? Um, I think that uh, are you guys all familiar with Brian? Never heard of him. Oh, really? Seriously? Oh, G Gilbert, I think probably has, but all right. So look him up, Brian Fanzo. He's got a website. He does quite a bit on Periscope. He gets invited to speak at a lot of these live streaming uh, summits, like Periscope Summit. Um, mm -hmm. So he's one of those guys that uh, considers uh, considers himself, and many consider him an influencer, and especially an influencer in the millennial segment. Um, much like Gary V is, even though he's he's older, he's also an influencer to a lot of millennials. But Brian mm -hmm. Fanzo is to the point, I would say, arguably, where a lot of brands are going to him. All sorts of brands uh, asking, you know, paying for his influence to um you know to help support those and so i think that he has now created a business of his influence and i question how influential are you now that you are you have become a business you're you're now i am president of influencer <laughs> you know Chief influential officer I, you know my my pay is to you know uh, create influence um i, I don't know i mean i, I I wonder. I wonder if something starts to get lost a long way once once you monetize it to that level. You know. I I I I I, I love money, and uh, I'm gonna say as long as you are being authentic. And he did something before he had that money. He created that audience and he created that following, and people want to hear what he has to say. So that is actually real. He didn't get paid to build it. He actually built that with blood, right. sweat, and tears. So I would say right. absolutely an influence, and he should be paid to do that because. He has some sort of secret sauce that somebody's trying to like. How do you get all these people to listen to you? Like, yeah. who cares? I need to stand next to you and take a selfie. Like, this is what brands are doing with him right now. So, yeah. And, and you know, the, the, not last forever. So it's like, write it, dude. Take the money. Like, and that's the, not the big, that's that big secret. Move. And I think that big secret when you look at these influencers that are out there. Uh, either on uh, YouTube or on Periscope or so forth. I mean, they're just being themselves. And it just so happens that being themselves is really entertaining or really inspiring. Yeah. And right. um, mm -hmm. I don't think it's something you can bottle and and recreate. Um, either someone's got it or they don't. It's, it's almost, uh, you know, it's almost like, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, so some people just are, are naturals and, and they, and people, uh, people connect with those. I mean, there are others that uh, that try, and I, I see them. I mean, they 
they're on Periscope all the time and they're trying to work up an audience and they're trying to, there, there's some people that I see that they love Grant Cardone and they're trying to replicate the Grant Cardone style and it, it just isn't working because Grant Cardone is Grant Cardone. Gary Vaynerchuk is Gary Vaynerchuk. Um, you know, so. Don't be the second someone else, be the first you. My mentor yeah. told me that years ago. He goes, he, I asked him to mentor me. He said, no, I'm not going to mentor you. He said, I said, I want to be like you. He goes, I'm already doing me. He's like, you do you. Right. Why would you want to right. be the second? I'm like, I did it. Like, be the first Ricardo, not the second George, you know? And it was like, you right. know, I didn't like the advice, but it was very good advice. And it's, and it's harder to go inside and actually develop your own voice and, you know, get some bumps and scrapes and, and build a real audience. But uh, it's what's like a relationship. That's yeah. what actually lasts in the long run. Mm -hmm. But those are yeah. also the influencers that are most successful are the ones that are just straight up being themselves versus yeah. um, coming up with this is what it costs to do this end of story. Um, I think it's the ones that are willing to, whether there's a price tag attached to it or not, the ones that are willing to collaborate um, right. and work with you to find something that works for your client and for them. That is when things, um, if someone's looking for viral, has a more likelihood of happening because it's authentic, it's organic, and it's just happening more naturally versus a straight exchange um, for money. money. For it. It's, yeah. I mean, yeah. it's it's such a big part of PR. And if we want to go back to more of a traditional PR conversation versus advertising, if someone says to me, I want to be in the Globe and Mail, fantastic, go buy an ad in the Globe and Mail. Otherwise, we're going to work for it, right? <laughs> so it's, it's real easy like, to get in. It's real simple. It's, you just, it's there's a the, whole line of people waiting to take your call. They will take your <laughs> card and you're in. Like, front of the and line access. <laughs> It's the honest Red. truth, and it's not meant to knock someone down. I mean, sometimes it does, but it's not meant to. It's just the honest truth in that there are so many people going after the same thing that if you're patient and you're willing to just continue that conversation and have that conversation with the people where what you want them to talk about is actually relevant, then there's possibility. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think the PR example is a good one. I mean, because when you look at earned versus uh, paid media, um, you know, it's it's a you can really draw some parallels to kind of what we're talking about here with uh, paid versus organic uh, influencers, and uh, um, you know whether you know whether you you're trying to rush rush to the finish line or if you're willing to invest in this kind of relationship that we're talking about uh, over time and exactly. and it's and it's tough for those of us here that you know are uh work at agencies agency owners and um you know we're dealing with clients who you know help to pay our bills and uh and we're very we're very grateful for that and um but you know Say we love them, right? Uh, we're recording, right? So, um, <laughs> and you know, the, the thing is, is that you know, a lot of times, um, I experience it too that you know, they, they are just in such a hurry, um, to get some ROI to get those short term wins. Uh, they, they always seem to be late when they come to us, right? It's it's for whatever reason they had plenty of time to think about it on their own, but by the time they call us, it's like desperation. It's like I need something to happen within thirty days, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, and uh, and it's and it's tough to to for the smaller companies especially to to sell them on you know uh, an organic program and, and creating relationships and all that. Um, it's it's easier easier to have that conversation, I think, when you speak to a Coca Cola or Unilever or somebody like that. You somebody know? who has a little more runway in, in the pocketbook. Yeah. And someone who's like, so is that different between a big agency and let's say a, a smaller client? You know, you're dealing with a mom and pa shop or somebody with like less than five or ten people. Like they've got to get some return in this month, in this quarter, or things are going to look real bad for their business. Like, yeah. what? Is, yeah. How does that? influence your approach to social well, and influencers i'll tell you with me i'd be curious what uh you guys think too but for me 
um, when I'm dealing, because we, we have all sorts of clients at the agency, everything from local, regional to national. And uh, the approach is very different. And I've seen it from all sides. When I'm dealing with a regional local client uh, with smaller budgets that have that kind of uh, pressure and that sense of urgency, um, I, I do always believe that an integrated mix is important. And, and part of that integrated mix, having very organic components, but I also understand their need for short-term wins. So I integrate uh, many different or several different levels of, of paid programs in there uh, because, um, you know, my, my feeling is that if I can get them some short-term wins and, and get them ROI on their um, marketing investment, they're going to be very happy and continue working. And then over time, we can start pulling that back a little bit and putting more into the organic program um, and earned, earned media, for example, too, and put more into that and start pulling back a little bit on, on, on the paid, but be more aggressive in the beginning to get those short, short-term wins. You know, that's usually my, my strategic approach with those kind of clients. Jax, how, how was that for you? Um, I, I would definitely agree with that. I think, I mean, sort of to add to that, I definitely see the lower budget end of things having like, because I work with boutique brands. So there is, we are always needing to be a little bit more selective. Um, and I know we talked about this a, a tiny bit in the beginning, but mm -hmm. to add to that further, it's, um, so much of it comes back to the relationship that you're willing to build, not only with your client, but the influencer, because um, especially, and I'm speaking strictly from a PR standpoint, because nothing happens overnight. And when I compare it to something um, like PR, it's building that relationship and setting expectations that things happen over time. Absolutely. There could be a huge success with something tomorrow. Um, and that happens, but a lot of the time the expectation is manage it so that it could be months from now, right? Like yeah. I have editors come back to me and say, Hey, remember that brand that we worked with 12 months ago? Are you still with them? If not, how do I get in touch with them? Like, no, so they're out of business. You didn't publish their article. <laughs> 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 um, hopefully they're doing amazing and they're way above and beyond um, the boutique brands that I'm working with. But it happens because it really comes down to timeliness. And I think that that's a big part of what it's like to work with influencers. It's managing those expectations. And a lot of what I do isn't necessarily traditional um, PR. Yes, we pitch, but there's definitely a mixed media blend, I guess you could say, and looking for lots of creative ways, um, creative ways to work with boutique brands and within those budgets. And I think with that comes looking for opportunities that aren't necessarily directly pitching influencers um, and saying, what are you charging or here's the budget? It's mm -hmm. um, clients being surprised by the outcome because ultimately at the end of the day, no matter what it, the, I guess, tactic looks like or what the execution looks like, my goal with clients is to build brand awareness and partnering with another PR firm, which is something that I've done recently with a brand because one of my clients happened to fit within um, a weekend event they were doing. Um, looking at those as opportunities versus competition is beneficial to the client because it's just consistently building new relationships. And there could be one or two influencers at that event that, I never had a relationship with, but now have the opportunity to. I, so I think people need to be more willing to collaborate and not want to hold things. Um, yes, media right. lists are sacred <laughs> to PR people, but I think we just live in a world where we have to be more willing to share um, because influencers are not going anywhere and paying them is also not going anywhere. It's just finding more creative ways to have that message be authentic um, is really our goal, I think. Yeah, I mean, just like uh, when Facebook or social media or Web 2.0, as it was first called, it's going to evolve. And we're in really the beginning stages and infancy of social media influencers and paying people to actually share content and create posts and do different things. So I think it's it's going to grow. I think it's uh, if you're lucky enough to be the type of person that is entertaining enough that people give a shit what you say, uh, 
you have a bright future ahead of you. <laughs> <laughs> so and you should be grateful and respect that audience above all else. Even I would say even above the short term wins of money. It's like really respect right. that audience. Because if you don't have an audience, you are dead in the water. It's like overnight, people, you know, can be gone. So I know we've been on for about an hour now. Uh, I want to wrap the show up, the official <laughs> show. We can keep going. I'm sure we'll have a lot more to say in the after show. But uh, I after thank show. everyone. Oh, man, this is how we roll it. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Can't just have an after show. <laughs> it's like an after party, but better. <laughs> Stay so, tuned. So, Jacqueline, <laughs> why don't you tell everyone how they can get in touch with you? if they want to find out more about uh, you, what you're up to, or do you have any projects coming up next you want to give a shout out to? Go for it. Uh, nothing in particular coming up that I want to give a shout out to <laughs> other than, uh, however, I will say if there are any ladies listening, um, I do once a month uh, get together with other female entrepreneurs and host here in my office a Mimosa Mornings where it's a very mm. similar setting to this, only in person, where over mimosas, we just talk about everything life, entrepreneurship, and it's a essentially a safe space to have that kind of conversation. So if there are ladies on the call, you can learn about that. Um, however else you learn about what I'm doing, and that's at JacquelineDenise.com, or follow me at JacquelineDeniseCo on all of my social media platforms. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. Wagner, before, uh, what's, what's next and exciting in your world in Florida? Oh, uh, well, um, I don't know. We're, we're, this year is an expansion year for the agency. We, uh, um, we doubled in size and we moved into a, a larger office space. We were in a, a 4,000 square foot space. We're now in a 14,000 square foot space. So big upgrade. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Big upgrade. More um, people as well in that space? More people. Um, yet. Uh, we, we still have room to grow in that space. And that was the idea of getting a bigger space that would, we wouldn't have to keep moving all the time. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been great. And um, we see that even though we're a fully integrated advertising and marketing agency, definitely our digital marketing side has been growing uh, quite a bit. Uh, we, we, we're not a communications firm, so we don't do PR in house. We work with, so Jacqueline, maybe we'll have to talk at some point. We do work with PR firms and, and, uh, um, you know, and, and integrate them into some, some projects. So we partner a lot. Um, and in fact, when I uh, pitch new clients, I always tell them that it's very purposeful that we don't do PR in house because it's, it's not a discipline that, that we feel integrates with what we're doing and that, uh, uh, PR people uh, tend to have certain specialties and in, in areas that we we would like to seek them out for for a specific client. Um, and one more thing about the PR thing, I'll say, I I totally don't envy your your job when when I did work <laughs> when I did work for an agency that was full service communications and we had PR in house. Man, it was so difficult. When to to your point about you know how long it takes sometimes for someone to, to catch on or, you know, or things get bumped, you could be pitching something for like four months and they're paying that retainer every month. But if they don't see the feature, if they don't see the result, they're like, why am I paying you that money? And it's so frustrating because I, I feel your pain, Jack. I know the work that you're doing every month, but they don't get it. They don't get it until they see something. I um, appreciate that. I know it's so, like pay me, but I can't promise you anything. No, <laughs> it's a it, solid it, pitch. <laughs> so it's so it's so tough. It's so tough. Um, but uh, but yeah, you. so yeah, no. So I I totally get it. Um, but yeah, so um, busier for us. I also. Uh, for those of uh, those people watching the recording that don't know me, um, I have a website. It's wagnerbranding.com, and it's uh, it's Wagner, Ricardo, not to Wagner. My bad. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm sorry, sorry man. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> no, I I respond to everything. Um, but it's uh, but it's Richard, Wagner. Stop acting like that, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's w a g n e r branding dot com, and uh, a lot of my uh, live show replays are there, my blogs and stuff like that. And uh, I do a lot of public speaking, um, a, a lot of public speaking in terms of um, experience marketing and um, um, and and social uh, activation marketing. So if you want to learn more about me. 
That's where I'm at. And I work for the guy as their vice president of strategy and insights. Brilliant. Thank you. Awesome. Wagner. <laughs> Tell me about that. It's okay. It's okay. Tea, my man, what's up? What's next for you? What's uh, I know you just finished Desi Fest. What's, yeah. Uh, what's so first going on? Mark, my name is Satish, not Desi Fest. Sorry, <laughs> I uh, logged in with the, with the music Twitter account. And so, if you guys are watching and a recording, it's Satish Bala. My agency is Blue Van Digital, based out of Toronto. Uh, and you know, my love affair with social media is still going. Um, and, and I think about two years ago, we decided we're not going to try to figure it out. We're just going to partner with people that uh, are in the process of sort of being awesome at it. And so we take social strategy and influencers to the point of uh, seeing that it's a valid strategic investment. And then we call on people that are, are doing it and say, hey, here's the, the things that we want. Here's an opportunity. To do yeah. That. And, yeah. you know, I'm a ComSci graduate. I'm, I'm very sort of product driven, like internal nerdy kid. So. For us, moving into mobile and retail space was a lot more exciting than trying to figure out what social strategic sort of influencer marketing was about. So a lot of work we, we've been doing in the last year and getting into 2017 is about understanding how retail and mobile and beacons and all this stuff are playing together, right. not just for the big boys, but the small mom and pop shops. Right. How could they yeah. benefit from that? And so we're doing some really cool stuff in that. Uh, and the music side has been really interesting. You know, I run a, a music label working specifically in the South Asian community. And so all of a sudden now, uh, the thing I'm trying to run away from influencer marketing, it keeps chasing me because <laughs> they want me to put together a team of influential South Asians. And I'm like, ah. Leave me they, want, they want your money. They're like, I'm an influencer. <laughs> Pay me my money. Pay me my money. <laughs> As long as we're not paid in rupees, we're fine. We're good. Uh, so it's, you know, I think it's an exciting time. To, to do what we do and everything sort of is at such an infancy that, you know, uh, a few key people with some smart ideas can start to build some structure totally. for others to sort of learn from and sort of expand. So I think that's what I was excited about from today's conversation. I go, where can we start to put some structure in? So it's not the wild, wild west that, you mm -hmm. know, clients don't create the structure, but the people that are adding value to the process can create the structure or this monetization, whether it's just great content. I mean, Ultimately, not a lot of us have exciting lives to be influencers. Like, I try to daily vlog and it sucks. Like, it's just, you know, my, my mom really loves it. My wife likes it. But for everybody one else, consistent fan. Mom's like, like it like crazy. You know, it's, it's crazy. And so to that, to that top percentile that actually get up in the morning and work on vlogs and work on shots and et cetera, I think if we can put a structure in to really get them the success they deserve for creating yeah. the content that makes our lives easier, I think that's a really sort of good aspirational thing that we should work on. Everybody else eventually will either give up or drop out or not have the fans. And if you don't have the fans, you can't influence anybody. So the world yeah. will fix itself. The but you can catch me at Blue Van Digital or just Google Satish Bala. I, I make it a point to be all over the place. Yes, you are, man. Thank you so much for that. My name is Ricardo McRae. This is The Framed Podcast. Thank you so much for listening, watching, however you're consuming this. I will have links to everyone's stuff below wherever you're seeing this. So you'll be able to connect with them on social. And the next podcast that we have coming up uh, is on Wednesday, uh, the 6th. And that one is around uh, racial bias and the impact on Black lives. And the one following week on the 15th of June, uh, Satish is coming back on and we're talking about uh, help me sleep in my baby. Uh, dad, <laughs> Satish is a dad. We're gonna have some more people on. We're gonna get some advice. On so it, so the the sixth is a Monday. I think you said Wednesday. The sixth the is Wednesday a Monday. Is the eighth. is the third? No. Eighth. Yeah. The eighth. Wednesday the eighth. Wednesday's the eighth. Every Wednesday. Yeah. Cool. Wednesday. We don't. So the eighth and then the fifteenth, we'll be doing the dad blab, as I like to call it. And uh, that one's going to be a lot of fun, too. So check me out on Blab. Check me out everywhere on social. I am Ricardo McRae. Thank you so much. It's been a slice, and we'll see you next time.